get the camera. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Small Cap Discoveries conference call. Today on our call, we have Tony Busseri, the CEO of Route One. Route One trades on the TSX Venture Exchange under the symbol ROI and on the OTC under ROIUF. The company is trading at 82 cents with roughly 35 million shares outstanding or about a $29 million market cap. I'd now like to hand it over to Paul Andriola. Awesome, thanks Trevor. Um, uh, we are very excited to have Tony here with us. Uh, Route One, as a number of our listeners are gonna know, we, uh, we recently uh, started coverage on Route One, um, we are also uh, excited about the fact that we've got an opportunity to participate in the financing. Um, Route One is a company that we've uh, been following for a while. Um, had an opportunity to talk to Tony uh, a couple weeks ago, maybe even further than that, but uh, really like what we've heard. And so uh, it's great that we can bring Tony uh, to uh, our subscriber base and have him tell the story. So Tony, on that note, um, Thanks for uh, joining us today, and uh, I understand you have a presentation deck that you're going to go through for us. So, uh, welcome to uh, welcome to the broadcast. Thanks, Paul. Appreciate that, Andrew. Thank you. Um, and to our li the listeners, thanks for taking the time and showing some interest in Route One. Um, I, I assume you all can see my screen now, so I'm just going to flip right to. I guess I probably should learn how to use this functionality. I'll flip right to page three of our presentation, and since some of you are new to the story. Uh, I'll take a second to describe our business model. The model really is one about our clients' data. Um, and when it, as it pertains to their data, it's about creating better outcomes with it. I know it sounds kind of cute and cheeky maybe, but simply put, we are, we are delivering better outcomes for our clients using their data. We built their bona fides as a company in the data security arena. And since that point in time, I've expanded to do a few more things. But data security being a principal uh, item for us, we have a technology, our flagship technology called MobiKey. It's a secure remote access technology that competes with VPNs and other browser-based browser solutions. It's heavily used by the US uh, government, particularly the Department of Defense. We also uh, work with our clients, not only to secure their data, but then to analyze their data. And we have a couple of technologies that play in this area. One of them is our own, it's called Action Plan. It's a data analytics technology um, that's used by the automotive uh, vertical, in particular tier one parts manufacturers to improve their efficiency and better understand on a real-time basis when an input, electrical input, is acting outside of the parameters that they want and also prioritizing which input has the greatest utility if there's scarce resources to fix them. The other uh, advanced analytics, or uh, I guess you would call it data analytics technology that we work with is one in the license plate recognition space. So big jump here. We're using video to capture license plates. We partnered up with Genetech out of Montreal and their technology called AutoView, we bring to parking lot operators as well as public safety, uh, law enforcement. And that technology is used on a real-time basis to scan plates and to be able to identify a plate that they're looking for. Maybe it's one where there's a warrant for arrest or it's an amber alert, or it's simply a parking infraction. Or if I'm a parking lot operator, I can let people into a lot without a human attendant and direct them efficiently to the space we want them to go to. So again, data security, data analytics, the two areas data analytics we're overly focused on right now, license plate recognition technology, and the technology to help out manufacturers improve their efficiency. The third element to our business, and I'll flip over here to page four, really deals with data visualization. So if I'm securing the data, analyzing the data, why am I not capturing the profit from that profit chain related to the outcome of the client? So we're reselling the rugged devices our clients would use in an operating room, on a factory floor, out on an oil field, oil field, in a police car, anywhere. So the visualization aspect, we're not an OEM, we're not Panasonic, we're not GTAC, we're not Dell. We don't manufacture rugged laptops or tablets, but we do use them and resell them and capture the profit associated with that. The last element to our data-centric outcomes-based business model really looks at developing proprietary technologies 
for our clients to make their investment in technology more effective for them. So not saying we're a development shop and we don't have a bunch of developers in Ukraine, but we do do our use our team, excuse me, based out of Boca Raton, Florida, to be available to support our clients when they want to tweak technologies that aren't necessarily our own. A good example of that would be if I'm using license plate recognition technology as a parking lot operator, and I also have a, a automated billing system, I want those two technologies to be able to talk. And that's a role that we would play with their clients to create a better outcome. We also provide on-prem client services. Um, that could be filling in uh, as an outsource IT group from time to time to support a client and deal with hardware break and fixes. So a little different business model and people sometimes ask me and say, Tony, what are you most analogous to? Because it's a little bit hard for me to get my hands around your unique business model. I would say this, and not at all that we're a Lockheed Martin or General Dynamics, but we do do a bunch of integration and we do bring our own technologies in certain cases to the table to help our clients to create the best outcome. Look, a lot of people will call that solution-based selling. We call that outcome-based selling because we think part of our responsibility in partnering with clients is at times to be a step ahead of them, understand where they're participating in their vertical and what, I, what items may be coming down the path we think our clients should be looking at and providing alternatives to them to resolve those issues before, before candidly they become issues. So on a high level, that's us as Route 1. Um, this slide deck I'm showing you today, I use for the presentation of our third quarter results that were, they hit the wire earlier today, this morning. So I'm gonna to touch on them real briefly. If you don't know us much, again, we changed quite a bit. Back in 15, 16, and 17, as shown here on page five, we were just a MobiKey player, a SaaS, clean SaaS-based uh, technology company. When we started to change or morph um, and get involved in the data analytics and then ultimately the data visualization areas, it changed the revenue profile, it changed the margin profile. When you're reselling others' hardware, you don't capture the high-end margins of 78 to 90%. So the third quarter, excuse me, the year to date, and we'll go through quarters in a second, we've now generated slightly more than 22 million of revenue, about a million seven of EBITDA, and we generated, or we've had a net loss of about 800 grand. Now we're gonna talk about some of those reasons in a few slides here, why there actually was an accounting loss, which I wanna stress from a cash flow loss. Let's look at the quarters. You can see that for this quarter, it actually is a record quarter for us from a gross profit perspective, as well as EBITDA perspective. Um, we were right just shy of $800,000 for EBITDA. And we would expect that number to continue to grow, you know, being considerate of the fact that the fourth calendar, fourth quarter for us in the US at least has the Thanksgiving and the Christmas variables. But as a business, uh, we continue to drive greater and greater operating cash flow. Now let's talk a little bit about that net loss during the, the quarter. There is a couple of contributing factors that I'll just touch on. One is, uh, if you're getting to know the name, we've been contesting the fact that a large player named VMware that owns AirWatch, a mobile device management software, um, that they infringed on a patent of ours. And we've actually sued them going back three years ago in the US and more recently here in Canada. Um, we were proceeding fairly well with that piece of litigation till literally uh, they went to the bullpen and brought in a new judge. <laughs> Um, the judge that was on the file, I guess, was overloaded with work. And when the new judge came in, he took a different view of the case. And it's gone as far as the fact that we lost on summary judgment um, and we were ordered to pay about a million seven US and um, in their legal fees being air watches. We, during the quarter, posted a bond for that as we're contesting it or appealing it. Um, that's fully backed or cash collateralized. So we had the cash to be able to do that as a company without having to raise any money. Um, on this subject, because I, asked, I get asked a lot about where are you heading with the litigation? And it's safe to say that as a company, we're very aware of that uh, the recent results in the courts in the US have not been productive. Uh, we think we have a strong case in Canada. 
And it wouldn't be a bad guess to think that not only are we looking at pushing forward to change the, the tone, but at the same time, if there is a, a settlement with AirWatch, we might enter into that to allow us to move beyond it. The other item I want to talk about from the context of this quarter, and I'm just going to flip back here to page six, is part of that reselling business is selling rugged devices to different players in the U.S., um, transactional-based work. During the course of the quarter, uh, a criminal outfit, um, we were one of a number of players that got caught into a scheme where we qualified the fake client as a hospital, even though they had a website, telephone numbers, all that good stuff. And we wrongly or uh, shipped goods to them and they never paid. The, the goods disappeared to Eastern Europe. Um, according to the FBI, we are one of a number of players that were duped uh, during the COVID-19 period. And the cost to us on a gross basis is about $600,000. That being said, we've taken, you know, we, we've set up on our books a receivable uh, because we do believe we have some form of insurance to cover this, maybe not all of it, but some of it. And we are going after the insurance company to get them to pay us for whatever we, we end up on. But we have taken the full charge in this quarter. So any recovery going forward will be, will be additive to the net income. Also from a cash perspective, because we've paid the OEM in this case, for the goods that we sold to a fake third party. Not happy about this. There's a few different things we've done so this won't happen again. And part of those things relate to the not opening up new accounts without meeting the account in person, which makes it a little tougher during COVID-19. But at the end of the day, these two items took a 778 grand EBITDA down to a net loss of 528. We do not expect uh, e either of these really to be recurring. Uh, if we settle up AirWatch, it will, we'll, we'll get to the end of this. So as you think about our business, there is some noise below EBITDA. And I just want to be upfront about that. Um, we don't think it's a drain on what we're doing as a business. Again, we have a strategy to, to wrap up the AirWatch litigation. Uh, the fraud has a one-time item that we are dealt with going forward. And we're quite excited about where the business can go. So just want to highlight again that the business today, you know, we're 36 to $40 million a year revenue. We're running between three and three and a half, or maybe a little bit more than that in EBITDA. And we are generating positive income, saving except for AirWatch litigation, I guess, if there was continuing expenses. We're, we're in a good position. Um, I think the name is interesting to Trevor and Paul from a couple of perspectives because we have great, great leverage in the current model. And so let's talk about that a little bit if I can. This slide here breaks up the subscription revenue and services uh, for the quarter, about 2.6 million. You'll note here a million nine of application software revenue. That's related to our MobiKey, our technology principally. And what's interesting about that incremental revenue from our application software is at about 90% margin. The only cost, direct cost against it is a commission that we would provide our sales rep. And why that's important is, is that late in the third quarter, we announced a large new order um, related to a new component of the US Department of Defense, where they bought 4,000 MobiKey subscribers um, and it was a million, 1.5 million US dollars of new revenue. So only a portion, about five weeks of that million five is showing in the third quarter of this past year or just recently uh, completed. So if I flip back again, that one, nine, two, three for the quarter is going to be something bigger as a result of the timing of the, the re most recent DOD contract award. So we are growing in that area. And I think as I spoke with Trevor and Paul, that's an intriguing area for the business. The other area of the business you should know is other services. And this really deals with our license plate recognition technology business. When we sell them uh, cameras, as well as uh, the intellectual property, the LPR technology from our partner, we also provide installation services, help desk support, 
ongoing services, training, uh, additional software applications to integrate their technology, the technology investment, excuse me. And that runs through this line item. And generally those contracts are three to five year contracts. Um, one of the interesting things you'll note here is that between Q2 and Q3, there is a slight drop from 509 and a quarter to 435, which relates to the fact that uh, COVID-19 impacted our ability to get on site and do certain maintenance um, or work as well as add new clients on their projects. So things got slid to the right. So I'm not saying or encouraging people to look at the 435 in the same way as the 1923, but a lot of that is contracted under multi-year contracts. Um, and we think it's a nice piece of business for us as we move forward. This uh, page nine is a bit of a summary of where we are with MobiKey. Again, it's not that we've sold hundreds of thousands or millions of units of this remote access technology. Our largest clients are the US government on the DOD, which would include the Navy, the Pentagon, um, Army, Air Force. And you might say, well, Tony, you're just listing off names. Here's the truth. All those groups that I gave you under full authorities to operate, which means our technology is allowed within their network. Um, those ATOs, that's the acronym for authorities to operate, uh, are multi-year research projects and approval processes and they're distinguishing factors for our cybersecurity technology. So you can see what's been going on, particularly since COVID-19 hit, some fairly robust, quick growth. And we are believers based off of the pilots ongoing with additional groups within the DOD, that that number of a little more than $700,000 um, a month will continue to grow. So we're quite excited about that. Um, I talk about the DOD a lot, we also have enterprise clients and the largest area of enterprise clients would fall into the banking vertical. Uh, we put out a press release over the last 60 days talking about First Community Bank. They're a regional bank in the US using the MobiKey technology for whether it's their mortgage specialists that are going out to clients' homes to talk with their clients about their mortgage renewal, whether it's a ministry of staff working from home during COVID-19. We do have banks using the technology and we see enterprises continuing to challenge themselves whether the VPN is the right technology for them as they move forward. From a, I, I, maybe I'm tuning my own horn here a little bit, but one of the things that we're quite proud of is during this period of growth um, and challenge within the macroeconomic environment, is that we've been pretty careful about how we spend money. We have grown our staff over the last six months from a total of 52 people or thereabouts to 58. But you'll note that the dollars really haven't jumped significantly. And what we try to do is before increasing the total amount of fixed costs we invest in our business, we look at redeploying capital where maybe it's not as efficiently used in, a, in one area and use it somewhere else. Um, and I think we're pretty good at doing that. So lots of leverage right now in our fixed cost structure. We have the ability to add in more gross profit without creating uh, additional amount of uh, operating expenses or fixed costs, excuse me. Here's a key metric for us and I'll keep on moving along and I promise I won't be more than another five or 10 minutes. Um, how'd you look at a business with the type of revenue mix issues that we'd have some quarters would have, you know, lots of transactional business. So you might have your GP margin go from 38% to 33. Does that mean it's a bad quarter? Not necessarily. And in our case, I invite people to look at gross profit divided by sales and marketing. That's a good way to understand the type of return we're getting on each dollar we invest in our activities and to hold us accountable. So look at the absolute dollars invested in fixed costs in conjunction with the return or the gross profit we're generating against some of those fixed costs. So as you can see here, we have been doing a, a fairly good job over the last four to six quarters about getting better and better gross profit per sales and marketing dollar invested. And this to us is one of our two key metrics. From a balance sheet perspective related to the quarter before I shift gears a little bit, 
and talk to you about our current environment and the tactics we're taking to take advantage of it and be successful. The balance sheet, most balance sheets today for operating companies that have leases are IFRS challenged, I like to call it. There's unique ways now to dealing with rent or operating leases. Um, we also call things such as deferred revenue, now contract liabilities. So the balance sheet is a little unique. So let's go through a couple of things. First of all, under total current assets, we have $2.2 million in restricted cash related to posting the bond for the Airwatch litigation. So thus the jump from 5.4 principally to 8.8. .8. Other thing you need to look at is when you say you're working capital position, what we strip out contract liability for the simple reason that so long as our lights stay on, there's no cost to deliver that service on their Mobi key. So we look at our net working capital position as one that's adjusted for contract liability. And as you can see, since the end of March to, to the end of September, that's been a positive number. Um, and we think it'll continue to be a good number for us. Uh, from a bank debt and seller note perspective, seller note being uh, vendor take back notes as part of acquisitions, it's been in the, with the exception of June 30th, where we had some large one-time cash inflows from large MobiKey renewals. Um, you can see it's been about 2 million and change in bank debt and seller notes. One, you know, I skipped over it, but we've been an active participant in our own stock and buying it back. Oh, generally over the course of a 12 month window, um, we're, we've been buying back between five and $600,000 worth of our own stock supporting it. And there's not a lot of nano caps or micro caps that are able to do that. We're now at the stage in our life cycle that we want to more aggressively grow um, the gross profit, the EBITDA of the business, because we think the opportunities are there. We have the operational capability to integrate new acquisitions. Um, and we're ready to, to push this business model a little bit and, and not trying to get too far ahead of myself, but that's why we're doing the capital raise. Peter and I believe our CFO, we believe there's one or more deals to get done in the next hundred days or thereabouts. And it's better finalizing the negotiations with those sellers when you have cash on the balance sheet versus telling people you'll find it or take more stock or do a VTB. So jumping off the balance sheet, um, here's a quick profiling of our CapEx. You'll note that um, in Q2, we invested a lot of money in computer hardware. That's related to the private cloud infrastructures we have a couple of them, one with the Navy, one with the Pentagon. Those infrastructures allow the MobiKey technology to work. And we're from time to time replacing hardware or expanding hardware to provide capacity for a greater number of MobiKey users. So what I expect over the go forward 12 months for us to spend five to $600,000 on sustenance capital expenditures, no, we're probably more in that range of 250 to $300,000. So if, if you've been with this for a while, and I assume many of you haven't, then you know that I've been talking about uh, this calendar year as one that's been all about change. And for us, uh, this is a slide that's a cut and paste from our, my board deck. Um, working from home is here to stay. That's not a, a small change because of COVID. I think people have realized some of the benefits associated with it. And one of our clients being the Department of Defense, uh, the Pentagon is looking at having at least half of their workers continue to work from home, vaccine or not, over the next couple of years. So it's interesting that COVID-19 may have triggered more of a social change around how people deliver their services and work with organizations. Look, without making a political statement, I think probably a little more in the U.S. than in Canada, there has been some level of social unrest. That is moved towards policing and law enforcement and their, the underpinning budgets. Um, we'll talk about that in a little more in a second, but COVID-19 has really stressed state and local government budgets and there are gonna be cutbacks, period. The third point goes more to the social issue. Community transparency is a critical theme and we're a participant in that area, whether it's license plate recognition technology, whether it's law enforcement officers wearing body-worn cameras, but simply put, access and security of the underlying data 
for those that have entitlements and should be able to use it. You know, one of the interesting things when you think of the opportunity for us is Seattle announced yesterday a 18% cut, cut to their policing budget, but they also announced that that money wasn't being pulled out of the system principally. It was going to be used in what they call more community-centric uh, initiatives. Part of those initiatives, because we're, that Seattle is a client of ours, is body-worn cameras and license plate recognition. So would you use a camera at a homeowners association for access and entry for cars that should be there, but also to track if there's a crime and give you more information and therefore potentially reducing the number of uh, patrol cars and patrol people in those cars. Uh, Body-worn cameras create a sense of transparency in the interaction between law enforcement officials as well as the community. And so long as that data is being retained in a secure, appropriate fashion, and then becomes available to all parties that have entitlements to it, it works. So we actually see the social change potentially being a catalyst for more of Route 1. The fourth point I bring up here is the U.S. federal election. There will be a real impact on the economy, how tax dollars are to be spent and public policy as a result of the Biden administration coming into power in January. Again, not a political comment. The platforms were very different. Um, and we think, again, that we can participate in either platform. And it looks like the Biden administration will be taking power in January. So um, 2020 has been a mouthful for change. So how do we respond to it? Well, some of these things I've talked about, but let's just summarize it. Again, if you followed us over the last half year, you know we won a very large bid in California. We knocked out the incumbent Motorola through their wholly owned subsidiary Vigilant and, and won uh, a master services agreement for all law enforcement in California to directly buy from us for their license plate recognition technology needs. We think that's going to be really attractive. We think it'll be even more beneficial to us and our shareholders as COVID-19 moves away and we move deeper into 21. So we think that's a catalyst for strong organic growth. MobiKey, we think, again, as we talked about earlier, we're gonna to continue to advance enterprise MobiKey Mobi orders um, as well as government. We think we can continue to drive operational performance um, and improve upon that, driving additional EBITDA with freeze up cash flow for new organic growth initiatives and or acquisitions. We are bringing to market new video offerings, whether that be fixed LPR, whether that be a deeper investment in body-worn cameras, or even low-cost data storage options for communities that can't afford the current market offerings are generally built, think of a police force, very few of them are built for police forces or services of less than five cars or less than five people. There is a tertiary market opportunity there versus primary or secondary. And those are just three examples of things we will bring to market or have started to, and we think they'll be drivers for organic growth in 21. Um, we recently hired a VP of marketing, first time in our history, and quite candidly, the incremental cash flow generated during COVID-19 allowed us to grab this individual. And we're excited about that because the positioning of new offerings using social media, digital resources that advance, creating warm, real leads um, is an exciting opportunity for us. Again, if you've been with us a little bit, you know that we've been working over the last couple of years to update the new private or to update the private cloud infrastructure for the Department of the Navy. Um, it's been built. We have the ATO for it. We're just waiting for the green light to turn it on. Once that happens, we think the 4,500 or so Navy personnel using the MobiKey technology uh, will grow quite a bit. Uh, that new private cloud infrastructure brings new functionality in the most recent MobiKey offering to Navy personnel. The last two items I, I think I've talked a little bit about, I'm not sure I need to go through it a lot. Um, from a market cha uh, changes perspective, I, I can't stress enough that noise um, drowns out some of the great things that uh, we're doing from an operational perspective. We, we, we understand that. 
and what may have been appropriate and productive three years ago relative to holding AirWatch accountable to what we claim to be the patent infringement may no longer be the right thing to have going on in today's environment. So we are looking to profile the strong operating earnings that we're generating and continue to invest in those efforts. So let's lastly talk about what was another component of today's news release. Uh, Trevor and Paul are active in this element with this. We are looking to raise Canadian two and a half million dollars, an 85 cent unit offering, one uh, share and one common share purchase warrant at a strike price of a dollar, 18 months with that. Um, the regular statutory comments are made here. Um, the, the completion of the private placement obviously is subject to regulatory approval. And I can't stress enough, we are raising this money for growth. We're not raising the money for any other reasons. Some of those unique one-time things that happened during the third quarter was funded by our cash flow or debt facilities. And we're in a good position today. Um, when Paul and Trevor raised the idea with me, um, initially I wasn't actually that interested in it um, based off of how certain M&A opportunities have evolved. Um, there's, there's more of a reason to do that at this particular point in time. So that's, a, that's I'm not gonna say it's a quick overview of the company, it's about a 35 minute overview. And I thank you for your patience as I've gone through it. Paul? Awesome, Tony, thank you so much, that was great. Um, I, I'm gonna dive right into some questions that, um, that, that interest me. Um, we're, I mean, we're pretty excited about your MobiKey product. Um, why don't you maybe explain a little bit more exactly how it works, why, why it's better than some of the comp competing products that are out there? Yeah, 90% or thereabouts of the technologies that we would go up against would either be VPN-based or browser-based. So let, and VPN's the flavor of choice for most parties. And I, uh, so let's go at it this way. Simply put, a virtual private network based offering, a protocol with it, what it's doing is extracting the data that you wanna use from the corporate or enterprise network and pulling it onto the, the mobile device. I, okay, we're good. Uh, the mobile device that you're working from. And so, you may be able to have an encrypted protocol that's strong and there's no ability for a man in the middle of attack, but you're then relying upon that asset you're using or the computer you're using at home or wherever you are, not to have malware on it, to ensure it's encrypted, to have second instances of the software on it. And then ultimately you're relying on human beings under a policy to ensure they don't save that file, let's call it, on the C drive of your remote asset or turn around and email it to a girlfriend or whoever, whoever. That's the risk with VPN, that the auditability to be able to track the use of the information in itself is far from perfect. The second thing is a virtual private network on its own does nothing with authenticating the user. You can pair it up with one-time password tokens or things like that, but in itself, a VPN is a singular standalone product offering. Our mobi key is two things in one. It's smart card based two factor authentication to approve a user for based off of their entitlements and access. What's interesting about that, that's the same approach that the US government on the civilian and uh, military or defense side use. They use a full size smart card for user authentication. As Canadians, we know this and we're quite comfortable with it because it's on a chip on our visa card or bank card, et cetera. But using that chip, with the appropriate length of password, four digits or characters really isn't enough, is the strongest way and the most effective way to authenticate a user. As an example, biometrics is a single factor of authentication and in itself is not as secure or anywhere as secure as smart card based user authentication. So we bring that with our own proprietary protocol and our technology never pulls the data of the company or the file outside the corporate network. Effectively, what we're doing with our technology to be simple about it is we're boring the keyboard, the mouse and the, the screen of your remote asset, allowing you to see encrypted then decrypted pixels or screenshots of what's actually happening back within the secure environment on your host computer. And so nothing's actually coming to you. There's no footprint on the 
remote asset. There's no ability for malware to be pushed back inside the network. And candidly, in our model, your remote asset never becomes a node on your network, which is a powerful distinguishing factor as it pertains to new risk vectors. As I like to say in somewhat of a simple way, the security of the enterprise's network is not degraded by using MobiKey. By using VPN, it is. And that's just a fact. And too often in the enterprise world and with the Canadian federal government as an example, they're just not dismissive, but okay with that risk. Each organization will determine what level of risk they have around network security, data breaches, et cetera. But I can tell you, MobiKey has been used for over 10 years by the US federal government from everything from a contractor access to in theater. And it's used in some extreme cases where life and death do make a difference. And it is used in cases of simply administrative activities. Um, but it's important that we understand what MobiKey is and isn't. It is a remote access technology that gives you your full desktop resources, not an application, and doesn't compromise your network security or create any new risks. That's a long answer to a short question, Paul. <laughs> <laughs> you did well, you did well. You. Um, obviously, um, having the Department of Defense in the U.S. as a client that, that, that uh, showcases the, you know, the, the technical um, sort of uh, impressiveness of the product. But um, outside of the uh, sort of U.S. government, give me a sense of what, it, well, what's the addressable market? Like how big could MobiKey be if, uh, if you were to win you know, a sizable share of the market? Right, like how big can you dream, right? Yeah. Um, how yeah. many people have computers or, or virtual or physical machines through their employment, their volunteerism, whatever that is. I mean, we're talking hundreds of millions of users, right? Mm -hmm. I, I like to think about this. Uh, within a definable market within the U.S. Department of Defense, there's at least 5 million potential users. We have roughly 30,000 of those right now. People say, well, your technology has been around 10 years. Tony. It's got to be a dinosaur. It doesn't work so well, right? VPN's been used for 20 plus years <laughs> and it's still being used. I think our technology is very cutting edge. It fully integrates with unified communications, which is a neat thing to think that you could take this type of call on your desktop back on your office, but actually be seeing it on your phone. Think about that. So that's an interesting thing that we're able to do. If we're able, you know, let, let's be honest, if you add a thousand new users at the average revenue per user per year, which is, this is a fact of $400, you're adding $400,000 at 90% margin to your bottom line. It doesn't take, and I guess this is the key point, Paul, I've said in a very circuitous way, it doesn't take a million users or a hundred thousand users or even 10,000 users to significantly move the needle for our company relative to our EBITDA. Heaven forbid we land 10,000, 100,000 new users, completely transformative for the company. And no one would ever wish this, but COVID-19 has been a great catalyst to showcase what we bring to the table versus other technologies. And hopefully um, we will have that embracement. Now we're fighting a brand name, a big name. We, you know, we, we sell against this and we say we're the UnVPN. But the addressable market doesn't have to be 1 billion people or 100 million. I, you know, I think it's realistic to say that from where we are today, over the next couple of years, we should be able to grow this to base by 10, 20, 30,000 users. Um, no, that absolutely. I mean, it seems like you're just scratching the surface here in terms of the, the addressable market. Um, maybe, maybe let's get a little more color in some of the high profile contracts that you've won. Um, I believe, well, the Department of Defense, but we're, we're talking the Air Force, Navy. Um, and, and then I, I remember in discussion we had uh, earlier today, you mentioned also that there's some RFPs that are of interest. Uh, and now that, that might be outside of MobiKey, but give, give us a sense of sort of who you're talking to or some of the pilots or just put color around what, you know, what you can explain as far as MobiKey. Yeah, I, I'd be glad to. So... Um, it's safe to say that for MobiKey opportunities, we are running um, a few sizable pilots with new components of the U.S. Department of Defense or looking to tack on or add on the current initial deployments that are quite sizable. 
Um, you know, I talked about the rough number of a 5 million. I'm not suggesting we're going to land 5 million tomorrow. But I am saying we announced the contract for 4,000 users in August with a new component of the Department of Defense. And I would expect to grow that materially over the course of the next 60 days. Um, is that by 1,000, 2,000, 6,000 users? It's by a real number. Um, some of the other pilots that we have ongoing could lead to very sizable thousands of users numbers. And it'd be premature for me to speculate or forecast what that could look like. But the fact that we do have multiple pilots going on of size and we're deeply invested in them with the prospective client is, is very good. Um, I talked about the fact the new infrastructure with the Navy, Department of the Navy, is likely to lead to uh, an increase in our 4,500 or, or so users um, and, and quite quickly because I think there's pent up demand there for the technology. If I shift away from MobiKey just for a second, um, here's one when we're all Canadians and, uh, and so we can understand this. The R RCMP has come out with a request for information around deploying 11,000 body-worn cameras um, within six months. And right now, RCMP personnel do not wear body-worn cameras. This is specific to what started happening in June with the, the unfortunate death of George Floyd. And now policing or law enforcement personnel um, having to wear that. And under the Trudeau government, uh, he, he and his cabinet have determined that the RCMP should wear body-worn cameras and they're moving with haste. That's a massive opportunity. Similar things are going on across state and local governments in the US. The Biden administration has suggested that within 12 months, every law enforcement officer in the US will wear body-worn cameras. The dominant player in that space right now is Aon, um, Axon, excuse me, um, the Taser folks too. Um, but we think there's a piece of that pie that we can participate in. Maybe it's not going after some of the biggest opportunities, it's playing in the secondary and tertiary markets, but the addressable market here is in the thousands and thousands of law enforcement professionals. So um, we're talking, you know, towards, um, well, if we go to the market, may upwards of maybe half a million law enforcement officials. So we're quite excited about that. We think there's a piece of the pie for us and we think we can participate in it. As it pertains to license plate recognition technology bids, we're very active right now. In a, particularly in the Rocky Mountains and uh, the southwestern United States, as well as California, um, in projects and opportunities, and that as we land some of them, we will for sure announce them to the marketplace, maybe bundled together or ones big enough to talk about in itself. So, I would, Paul, maybe what you're getting to, where the callous organic growth, I, you know, I've given you the three sexier ones, quote unquote. One is body-worn cameras, two is license plate recognition, three is MobiKey in no particular order. I'm always remiss in talking about our, what I call the rocket fuel business for us, and that's reselling rugged devices. And you're like, well, Tony, there's nothing really differentiating there. It's more of a commodity. You're right. But if our clients using our other technologies are buying those goods, or we're using those contracts as Trojan horses to build relationships with leaders in the law enforcement or the com or community agencies, why wouldn't we? And so I firmly believe right now that COVID-19 has created pent up demand in corporate America for rugged devices. Um, I see a, a large opportunity for us as we move into 21 and 22. And candidly, that goes to some of the profiling of the acquisition opportunities. So I, there's a number of catalysts for us to grow with let alone identify new offerings and technologies, as I talked about also today, that can generate new revenue streams. Cool. Um, I want to go back to something you just said, um, just so for some clarity. You mentioned 400 average price of $400 per user uh, for MobiKey. Is that is that U.S. or Canadian dollars? That's Canadian dollars. Okay, gotcha. So, so the way I see it, then, uh, you know, quick back the napkin math. Uh, if it's 90% margin. Um, every every thousands uh, new license uh, users, you've got about three hundred sixty thousand a year in um, at gross margin, uh, which should almost go well. It does go straight to the bottom line, but we're looking at a penny a share per thousand. Yeah, I, I, I I'm being I'm rounding down on a number that's more close to four fifty mm -hmm. a year. 
<laughs> gotcha. I, if you're going to do the math, I'll, I'll give you more specific numbers. <laughs> <laughs> okay. okay. I, I always like to sort of round it down to uh, no, a no, sure I'm basis. No, no, I'm trying to build expectations. <laughs> <laughs> I, I do what I can here for sure. Um, uh, and uh, let's see. Um, so we, we talked a bit about sort of the financing or use of proceeds for financing. You're really going to use this fu these funds to go and, and find an acquisition that, that you feel will, will plug in and, and help grow your business. Um, it sounds like it's likely to be something in the, uh, I mean, hardware side or, uh, or uh, give me a better sense. Are you looking for uh, client relationships? Are you looking for technology? Are you looking for what, what is it you're really trying to, to get access to? Yeah, I think there's a couple of prongs to that strategy, and I think it's a great question. Um, one of them is simply buying client relations and good salespeople. Um, mm -hmm. So think of this, that if I can buy someone that has a strong relationship selling rugged devices to a chief of police in a smaller community, I'm more there's a greater likelihood I can have that same discussion now with the chief about body-worn cameras or about LPR. So often you're able to buy those type of businesses at two and a half to three times historical EBITDA, un unadjusted for synergies. Um, a lot of times those companies don't do their own installation of rugged devices in the police cars. We can do that. That's one of the synergies we would capture. And again, it's Trojan horse is often referred to that you're giving something up to get something. Um, in this case, I don't think we're giving anything up. I think we're buying something smart that's financially accretive and also allows us to create additional revenue with that core group of clients. So there's that for one. Two, we're also looking at technology players that would fit into the video arena for us. That might be struggling or broken plays that might be um, described as, as a yet not the shiny, beautiful company that's overvalued, mm -hmm. um, but is one that we can add our marketing girth to, our sales, and mar our sales capability, as well as our engineering team to maybe finish off the product, um, to bring it to market in a way that right away is accretive. We were looking at the technology in Q2, if you look back at some of our historical presentations, that would have been an add-on technology for police officers. Clearly with some of the things that happened in June, we felt going through that deal was not the right thing to do. But it was an early stage technology, no revenue yet, but on the cusp of being ready for commercial release. And we felt we could plug it in with some of our clients. And as budget dollars got redirected purely for policing in the community, we pulled back on it. But that would have been a really great example. So my line is, We'll buy the cash flow with salespeople and deep client relations, or we'll buy an early stage technology that we can bring to market that fits in with what we're currently offering to our clients. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Um, okay, I want to remind everybody that's listening. We we do we are open up for questions. If you want uh, me to ask uh, Tony a question, you're just uh, use the the chat function and uh, and let me know what you want me to ask. Um, hey, Tony. Um, the uh, you know you're you're running a business here. You're you're involved in M and A. Um, maybe give us a sense of your background and maybe some of the key members of your team's background, um, so we know how um, you know sort of how to see if there's uh, a track record of, of doing this before. Yeah, I look. I had the opportunity in the late '90s as a person in their late twenties um, to be a CEO of a Nasdaq-based solid waste management company. Um, I started from zero revenue and after about 42 acquisitions, uh, took it public on NASDAQ as the North America's seventh largest waste management company. It was in the hundreds of millions of dollars of revenue. Uh, had an enterprise value approaching a billion dollars. Um, and about 31, uh, I stepped away from that and went into private equity. And then was enticed by the past premier of Ontario, Mike Harris, to get back involved with a clean technology company turn it around, grow it, and then move on. That company was called Environmental Management Solutions, which was a bit of a profile company because folks like uh, Kevin O'Leary and uh, John Risley and, and Mike were on the board of the company. Uh, we cleaned it up through, even though we had to replace the founder CEO and a couple of proxy battles, um, then you know took the uh, business to the point where it was ready to go, brought in uh, a bunch uh, did a pipe deal with uh, our friends at OnCap, the mid-market fund of 
Fury Sports is on Onyx. Um, and at the point in time, the business was ready to grow again after about four years and recapped and had done its first couple of deals. I stepped away. I won't say I went to retirement. I decided that with my young twins that were um, under a, a couple of years of age, I wanted to spend more time as a dad. Um, and I sat on a number of boards and again, ran my own book. Um, and when I got involved with REL1, uh, it wasn't to be a CEO, it was an independent director with our current CFO, Peter Chodis, as well as Mike Harris, as you can get a theme here, Mike and I do a lot of business together. Um, and ultimately I was asked to come in and clean it up and we should be able to stabilize it because things in the data security or the security business, you clean them up and you sell them within two years for a hundred million dollars, don't you know? It's pretty simple stuff. <laughs> um, and so back in 2010, there is a misassessment, I would say on my part, of, of where the market was on the enterprise side with paying for data security. And I've been in it all the way through and put more and more money into it on my own. I, I think the punchline here is I feel a, a strong sense of ownership to seeing this business model uh, play out with success. I, I really like the company. We've, you know, we're now up to 50 employees. Uh, Peter Cholis is our CFO and my partner in this. Uh, Peter and I uh, crossed paths on a couple of different companies over the last 30 years. Peter being a past or ex-investment banker uh, brings real good capital markets expertise to the table. Um, then our, you know, and, and I, I'd be remiss if I didn't highlight our technologists. Uh, they're on our website. Jerry Awanski was our first CTO and a co-founder of the business. He is now our chief digital officer, so he's client facing. He is as close to our blue sky guy as you, as you can find. Jamie Gutierrez is our CTO, and is a deep mathematician and an encryption uh, expert. And I think he's one of the smartest men in the world. Uh, Jamie is critical when we're doing, getting our ATOs. Uh, having sat in uh, Leon Panetta's boardroom, <laughs> Uh, with uh, 20 or 30 uh, information assurance professionals and watch them grill them and quiz them as part of the due diligence on our MobiKey technology. I have a huge amount of confidence of the combination of Jamie and Jerry and that when they say something about our technology or our view on data security, it's going to be right and we're going to get to the outcome we want. So I think those two individuals are critical for us. And then we have a fairly... Uh, you know, open team. What do I mean by that? I don't have a COO. Uh, I have the sales team, a uh, series of vice presidents reporting directly to myself. I treat them as entrepreneurs inside an umbrella or a holding company. I want to empower them to own their client relations, to own the, the results of the projects they get involved with. And my job is to mentor them and provide the, the, the support services to them for them to take advantage of the opportunities in their geography. And they do that. Eventually we'll need um, a COO to better manage this. But right now I'm very close to the business. I don't micromanage it, but I do know what's going on. And I enjoy providing that mentoring role to some real talented people that are VPs of business development and sales for us. So maybe that provides you a little color, Paul, or there's additional questions around the subject of our org, glad to answer them. No, I just I wanted to make sure everybody understood that you sort of you, you've been there and done it uh, before, albeit with a different industry. Um, and especially what we always find is acquisitions. M and A is a tricky, um, tricky strategy, and if you haven't done it before, you, you end up missing a lot of the things that you should, uh, you know, you should you should know. Um, I, you know, I, um, you, you touched on it a little bit uh, earlier, but COVID, uh, you know, obviously has changed the world. Um, two, two part question here. One is around um, how does it affect your operations? And, uh, and we touched it a little bit more uh, already, but uh, on the opportunity going forward, um, maybe one more statement around what you see is uh, how it's changed your opportunity. Huh. Um, I, I think there's different ways to answering that because some of our segments react differently to it. Mm -hmm. So when it, it deals with the um, our public clients are the ones that are state and local governments. When they go into COVID-19 lockdown, it for sure impacts our ability to install video technologies, not kill deals, but push them to the right calendar wise. Um, as it pertains to selling rugged devices, that's an interesting one and a little bit tricky 
we saw this coming probably as soon as the people that did see it coming saw it because our manufacturing partners in Taiwan back in January started having significant delays with delivering rugged devices to us on time. And that was an interesting lead in. So um, when that happens, some of the timing on um, orders again can get shifted to the right uh, from a calendar perspective, not evaporate on you, but the timing to deliver and ironically, whether it's Dell or Panasonic or GTEC, all these players in some way, shape or form rely on subcomponents or components coming out of China or Taiwan. And so when one gets impacted, the truth is most get impacted. Uh, so that, that, that's, that's an interesting part of it. Look, the, the positive here is Mobiki, right? Um, if people are racing around trying to find a secure technology to support their staff working from home, that's a huge win and opportunity for us. We're able to spin up within a day and less uh, a large number of users to support that ability to work from home. So those would be kind of my three quick responses. Um, I guess what it does do is uh, as a smaller organization servicing larger clients, it's, it puts some level of pressure or stress on us because the mission critical nature of some of our uh, serve, the, who we're serving um, and, you know, we, we need a professional group that knows how to handle that. We have a 724-52 help desk. No, it's not nine to five, five days a week. It's all the time. You don't know when a three-star admiral serving with the Department of, of the Navy over in Japan may be calling you um, because whatever, the internet doesn't work. And it's not, often it's not about our technology. It's something a little broader and we're helping them out. So I... I it, it, it's a responsibility and a theme. And uh, I think this organization over the course of the last eight or nine months, or maybe a little longer, has dealt with that enhanced level of stress or pressure um, because this is a unique environment. And I think this team do, has done extremely well um, in a way where we're very proud of and feel fortunate for the opportunities we've been given with all kinds of different clients. And so um, I think we're battle tested right now. And, I, and Paul, I, Going back to a point you said a little bit ago, you know, on my own, I bought and sold over 200 businesses. <laughs> um, and I think that, uh, not that as Sinatra had said, I wrote the book, um, but we do understand how you can fail uh, integrating businesses. We know how to do due diligence and we know what to look for through those processes. Um, I think we're, I think we're good, good at it. I, anyone that says they're great and they're perfect, I would, would they're lying. Um, as, as we say in many sports, each game's unique and uh, there's different, you learn every day. But I, I think we know how to integrate business as well. We know how to price them out. And I, I don't think there's enhanced risk as a result of that element to our strategy. Awesome. Um, you, you know the landscape better than we do, but any other publicly traded uh, companies you say would be comparable to what you guys, uh, you know, the different sectors you're in? Any, any companies we should be looking at just to, to compare you guys? Um, it, no. <laughs> I, mean, I, I say no, um, <laughs> because I'd have to break it down by, you know, segment of the business, let's call it. Mm -hmm. No, I, you know, like, I, and I'm being, a, a, you know, a little flip when I say, you know, take a look at the system integrators out there like Lockheed or others, but the, the concepts there are IBM or CGI. I, I think the truth with it is we're using technology and the client's data to create those outcomes. So if you can define someone doing that, great. I mean, if you're considering us with other OEE players around, you know, how we deal with our automotive clients to improve efficiency, I, I don't think that's appropriate characterization. We're not a pure play software company, but we have a lot of elements of it. We do all our in-house engineering testing and help desk here in America. It's not offshore to anywhere else. So I'm not criticizing others that do it, but our talent is here in the communities where we live and work and deliver our service to. So that engineering capability, uh, not just software engineering, but beyond that, uh, I think is unique and a big differentiator for us as a solutions or outcome-based company. Fantastic. Um, you know what, this is extremely rare. We've got no questions from the audience. Um, so we've obviously done our job well. Um, you've presented well, and I think I've, I, I, hopefully I've asked the right questions here. Um, you know, let, let's wrap it up. Um, a couple things, uh, one or two major points you wanna make sure that our listeners 
sort of walk away with or, or something that, you know, the investor should look out for, say, over the next six months, uh, what, what would you want to tell them? One is, is that um, when you look at their name as a public company, you'll see why hasn't, uh, until the recently over the last four to eight weeks, why hasn't the value of the business changed as you've dramatically upsized it? I think the truth is, is that the shareholder base needs a little real revitalization. Um, it's one of the other reasons we're doing the, the capital raise. We need fresh eyes, uh, fresh parties looking at it. And I, and I, there's nothing that's wrong with the business. Over a long period of time, we've operated at a high level. And this is a, this historically was a bit of a tired name on the venture. And because there's no direct comps to it, people then think there must be an issue with it. Um, and I'm just going at the heart of the matter here. I would invite you to look at what we deliver. I know the business model is a little different. It's not a pure play SaaS model. It's not a, a pure play bar like uh, Robert Hertzovic's company. Um, I, I think when you look at this, please look at it from the perspective that the, the unique features of our business model provide us a unique way to get enhanced margins, um, the solidified longer, deeper relationships with, with the clients. And it's not crazy to say, hey, there's a lot of room to move for this company. And we're quite excited about it. I, I've said openly before COVID, um, and recently I've been reiterating it, our goal is to quickly grow this to north of $100 million a year in revenue. Not because the revenue is important, but it's the enhanced EBITDA margin, EBITDA we can generate by leveraging our investment, leveraging the investment in infrastructure. And so I see two important plateaus for us at 100 million and 250 million. We have a model and a plan to get the, the, to the bigger number over the next few years. But in the short term, I think in 2021, we can get ourselves towards, if not at $100 million in run rate by the end of the year, which should generate for us sizably improved EBITDA margins and continue better return on every dollar we invest. Quite fantastic. Um, so what we have here, guys, is we've got uh, a company operating in what I would describe as three very sexy growth sectors. Um, you know, obviously a growing company itself that I think is quite misunderstood by the market. And I think that's really where our opportunity is. So um, uh, if, um, if somebody wants more information, Tony, um, what, uh, what's your website? Route one, one being numeric.com, R-O-U-T-E, numeric1.com. Fantastic. Okay. Today we've had Tony Baseri, uh, CEO of Route One Incorporated. Uh, the symbol is ROI.V on the uh, TSX Venture Exchange and ROIUF on the OTC. Tony, I want to thank you for being with us today. Thanks for the opportunity, folks. Have a good one.